nation would be under tremendous economic strain, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But Zambia is a special case, and that's because it became the first African country to default on its debt during these COVID times. Then, a man who calls himself the cattle boy made grand promises to get the economy back up on its feet. Hakainde Hichilema, a six-time opposition leader, has been elected president of Zambia in what many are touting as a youth-inspired change in leadership. But who is he and how did he manage to inspire the youth to win this election? Well, so, uh, to answer these and other questions, we are joined now by political economist Mele Bohang Pego. Mele Pego, thank you so much for speaking to us. This is really an election that has given Africans, I think, a lot to talk about. I think the, place, the first place to start would be, what did he get right? How did he manage to become an opposition leader who actually wins the youth vote in, in, in a democratic process? Mm, thanks, my lady. So the one thing is that he's been extremely persistent. So he's been working the ground, as you rightly say, this is his sixth attempt. So um, he's no novice. The second piece of that is that in so doing, he's been engaging in a lot of coalition building, which seems to be the nature of a lot of our African uh, politics, particularly opposition politics, over the last few years. We see that across Kenya, we see that in Zambia. We're probably seeing shades of that in places um, like, um, you know, across West Africa as well, where there's no real definitive party political movement, but rather conglomerations of movements in order to deal with um, uh, removing a, an overwhelmingly powerful party. So that's the other thing. And remember that about 10 other opposition leaders placed their weight threw their weight behind him as um, as a candidate. So he is on, not only um, representing the UPND, but he also represents this whole coalition of other movements. He's also made very grand promises around, as you rightly say, getting the economy moving, um, getting people working again, which has appealed to the youth voters. And the other thing that he did was that he also put in place a very powerful machinery to ensure that in terms of vote voter veracity and, and voter vote election integrity that they might the, the, the possibility for for dodgy elections or for rigging was minimized so he had this you know a parallel set of people thousands and thousands about 20,000 um, people who were also counting double counting as the results were emerging and that is a strategy that was um, employed by late president Michael Sata as well to ameliorate the possibility of voter rigging so it's quite a long deal Deep, complex series of coalition building, working the ground, working the system, and so forth. And lastly, just to add that it, it does no harm that he is a wealthy man and has been able to pour quite a bit of his own personal resources into this um, political endeavor. Yeah, and that, the fact that he is a, a tycoon um, in Zambia certainly, and I agree, as you say, it helps. Um, but then what he's talking and what he's saying, essentially, and being able to bring the economy up and running, are these plans that you think could actually work for Zambia? So, hmm, interesting question. He is very market orthodox. He's very he's he's looking at using the same modalities um, going back to the IMF. Remember that Zambia has just defaulted, but he's going back to the IMF and also making a you know making arrangements there to defer their debt payment um, and also to then re you know there's, a, there's it's also it's linked to what they used to call the HIPIC, uh, which was the high indebted country program, and basically. It's a, it's a form of debt deferment. So on the surface and in the short term, it does appear to solve problems because it means that you pay less or you pay later or you, you delay your debt. But of course, as we know, like with any debt, it only accrues interest in years to come. Um, and I think that it does speak into some of the, the, the complaints and the concerns that many of us have around IMF World Bank funding that is extremely conditional. Remember that, in fact, Zambia originally in the 1990s lost their airline um, as part of a, a debt to settle deal um, with the IMF. So I think that it's very unfortunate that it's uh, literally going back to a, a very problematic model of, um, of, of, of economic recovery. The other piece of that is, of course, that one of the reasons that uh, former President Lungu appealed to quite a few people was that he was 
on the surface, quite explicitly anti, you know, neoliberal. He didn't want to go into market orthodox. That, of course, a couple of years into his term, it was clear that he was also doing the, more of the same. Yeah. But I think that, yeah, certainly for new ideas um, and new economic models, I'm not sure that President-elect uh, Hichilema is um, providing those. Yeah, you know, if you'd looked at some of the discussions on social media yesterday as people were sharing their thoughts on this election, it was um, a, a very jovial sort of mood, right? The idea that young people voted for change in Zambia, people saying this is hope uh, for the continent, that people can vote for change. Um, I want to talk about whether or not Hichilema actually represents that. I mean, there's the, the fact that Zambia has just lost Kenneth Kaunda as well, and there's links between Kaunda and Hichilema as well. Yes, exactly. As I said when we spoke, um, in fact, the UPND is not per se a new formation. It is actually a formation that emerged from um, a, 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 a compromise or a coalition, I think, in 2006, between what used to be UNIP and two other movements. So um, it's not surprising that, in fact, late President Kaunda uh, in, to some extent had endorsed um, Ndate Hichilima's candidature and, um, you know, and had endorsed his, his campaign as well. Uh, and I think that this idea that we're seeing something new is quite interesting because what we're seeing a, a lot, and I mean, I think the same can be said about what we've seen in Kenya, what we've seen in places even uh, where, 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 where countries have had to remove overweening um, party po political agents. So the way that the Kenyans removed Kanu um, of, Ke of Kenyatta and Moy was, of course, with the, with, the, with the coalition. And we're seeing the same in Zambia with coalitionism rather than parties which really build on new political and economic models. And I do think that I do get concerned about the politics of personality, because if, in fact, these are parties which don't actually offer anything substantively new and different, but are rather built around removing the, you know, the, they're, really, they're rather built around the politics of removal, which are not invalid, but removing in exchange for what? Are we seeing anything radically, significantly different between one transaction and change of power to the next? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, you certainly have given us a lot to think about. As always, I thank you for your insightful views. We really do appreciate it that there. Political economist, Mele Bohang I mean, she, she, she brings up some good points, and I know yeah. the, the politics of removal, I agree with her, is maybe not the best way to have change. But I was just celebrating the fact that we had an election, and it seems on the surface to have been largely largely fair, right? right? And right. we had a peaceful transfer of power. Edward Lungu, he conceded and we've had this transfer of power, and we don't see enough of that on the continent. It's something maybe that's worth celebrating. Yeah, no, I 100% I, I yeah. agree with that, that we're finally starting to see democracy work on the continent. The bits and bobs is what we need to take a closer yeah. look at, but that's definitely an optimistic point. All right, let's, uh, 